now, the greatest radio shows of all time. Suspense. The Shadow Node. Washington calling David Harding, counter spy. Classic radio theater. The Great Gildersleeve. Fibber McGee and Molly. Dragnet. Gunsmoke. The Lone Ranger. Now, step back into our time machine with your host, Wyatt Cox. Good evening, friends of the Inner Sanctum. J. Edgar Hoover called it the finest program on radio. The official broadcast of the FBI, sponsored, of course, by an insurance company, the Equitable Life Insurance Company. Uh, This is your FBI and the Slaughterhouse Swindlers. This episode originally broadcast May 31st, 1946. The Equitable Life Assurance Society presents This is Your FBI. This is your FBI, an official broadcast from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation, presented as a public service by the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States and the Equitable Society's representative in your community. Tonight's FBI file, The Slaughterhouse Swindlers. Professional criminals are avowed enemies of society, and as such merit the full penalty prescribed by the laws which they violate. But so-called good citizens who conspire with criminals to violate the law for personal gain are the Benedict Arnolds of society. The prayers for profit of the respect and welfare of those whom they would call fellow citizens. And as such, they merit the contemptuous kind of moral condemnation that is reserved for all traitors. On a modest little dairy farm a few miles out of Des Moines, Mrs. Reba Jones, recently widowed, has just completed the morning's chores and is walking up to the house when two men drive up in a truck designed for hauling livestock. Good morning, ma'am. Good morning. Are you Mrs. Reba Jones? Yes, sir. Well, my name's Latimer, and this is Mr. Randall. Oh, we're inspectors for the Department of Agriculture. Oh, how do you do? Hello. Uh, what can I do for you? Well, I hate to tell you this, Mrs. Jones, but we're here on a kind of unpleasant mission. What's wrong? Well, a dairy company you sell your milk to has just reported to us a very unfavorable bacteria count on some of the milk from here. Oh, but they never said anything to me about it. Well, it's their duty to report to us first, Mrs. Jones, and our duty to check on your cows. Oh. You see, a lot of the dairy company's products are sold across the state line. And that makes it Uncle Sam's business to see that the quality meets federal standards of purity. Of of course. Mrs. Jones, uh, how many cows in your herd? Well, I... There's only 12 heads. Mm Mm-hmm. You gonna test them now? That's right. And if you... If you find some of them's deceased... Well, we'll have to condemn them. Oh, yes, we'll have to take them with us, Mrs. Jones. Uh, But we're authorized to pay you a condemnation fee. But I... I just can't afford to lose any. Even with the whole herd, I just barely make a living from them. You wouldn't want to sell milk that you knew to be diseased, would you? No. Of course not. Uh, Well, uh, the herd is down the pasture now. I'll go and get them into the barn for you. Oh, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Jones. (laughs) Well, Al, she fell for it okay. (laughs) We should clip her for the whole herd. Come on. boys. I'm giving you $200 a head for them cows. I thought you ran a slaughterhouse, Jenkins, not a clip. Now, let me handle this, Al. $200. That's my price. You better take another look at the weight figures, Jenkins. 
Price stands. Take it or leave it. Oh, look, we take all the risk getting these cows. Latimer, as far as I'm concerned, they're your own cows. I operate a legitimate licensed slaughterhouse. Who's kidding who? You're up to your ears in the black market, same as we are. Now, look here. You said yourself three of the last head we brought you a disease. And they were, too. But you bought them from us, didn't you? Maybe you'd better take your cows to some other slaughterhouse. Oh, no, wait a minute, wait a minute, both of you. You've got us over a barrel, Mr. Jenkins, and you know it. So, just give us a dough. Hmm. Now you're talking sense. Here's your money. Count it if you like. Oh, I'm sure it's all there. You don't steal your money that way. What do you mean? <laughs> what do you think? Come on now. Right. We'll be seeing you, Mr. Jenkins. Good day. Go ahead. Okay. Uh, what did you settle so easy for? Because we couldn't take the cows anyplace else. They were worth more than he gave us. What he gave us was only a down payment. What do you mean? I think I know a way to tap that old geezer for plenty. It was a little earlier that same day when Special Agent Meade of the Des Moines Field Office of the FBI entered the office of Agent in Charge Clark. Did you send for me, Mr. Clark? Oh, yes, Meade. Looks like we've got an impersonation swindle case to go to work on. Oh? A couple of days ago, two men posing as inspectors of the Department of Agriculture condemned some cows on a farm near the city. Yes? They claimed these cows were diseased, so they were authorized to pay $50 a head for them, and did, then loaded the cows into a truck and drove away. The black market, no doubt. More than likely. But the act of impersonating a federal officer is our immediate angle. <laughs> How do we hear about it? Well, the widow who owned the cows got suspicious later on, called the public health officer here in Des Moines. He just called me a minute ago. I guess he'd already checked with the Department of Agriculture. Yes, and I double-checked. What's the first move? You better drive out there right away and interview the victim. There may be others by now. That's why we want to work fast. What's her name? Mrs. Ruth Mason. Here. This is the location of her farm. Hmm. Okay. And Mead, get a good description of the men and any other lead you can and hurry back. Right. <laughs> Up in here by the stock pens. Right. There's old Jenkins coming out of the office now. Okay, stop the truck. We better get our dough for these cows before we spring the other deal on them. Shut up, here he comes. Now let me do the talking. Okay. Yeah. You fellas seem to be working pretty fast. Yeah, we don't believe in letting the grass grow under cows, Jenkins. Well, I've dead, huh? Pretty good looking stuff, too. For change. Where'd you get him? Ain't you forgetting what you said? As far as you're concerned, all the cows we bring belong to us. All right, all right. Can you handle these? I can use all you get like that. That's fine. Al, huh? you run these over to the scales. Mr. Jenkins and I have got business to talk over. Okay. Can we go to your office? Sure. Come ahead. Go ahead in. All right. Well, what's on your mind, Vladimir? You said you could handle all the cows we could get as good as those in the truck. That's right. Could you handle, say, say 150 hen? Where are you going to get that many? Could you handle them? Certainly. Well, then I can get them all right. Uh, there's just one hitch. What's that? Money. I don't get you. Now, look, we lay out cash for them animals. We ain't getting no 150 head unless we put the dough on the line. Oh. So, where do we get the cash? How much would they cost? Me or you? Hmm? Well, I'm supposed to make a profit, you know. And how much would they cost you? About a hundred a head. It's $15,000. Yeah, that's right. Who are you buying them from? <laughs> Now, you ain't trapping me into a giveaway like that. <laughs> are you interested in putting up the dough? Maybe. Now, look, don't hedge. Are you or ain't you? 
How do I know this isn't a swindle? Well, you can come along if you want when I swing the deal. When would that be? Oh, right now if you like. I yeah, don't keep that kind of money around the office. Hmm. Uh, when could you get it? Later in the day. Well, then we'll knock them off tonight. How much do you have to charge me for the cows? Usual rate. Two hundred a head. That's letting you fellas operate in my money and make a hundred percent profit. It's too much. Now look, Mr. Jenkins. Take it or leave it. I... Be here at my office tonight. Can I come in, Mr. Clark? Oh, yes. Come ahead, Mead. Did you talk to the woman out at the farm? Yes. Get any good leads? She gave a pretty good description of the two men. Anybody we know? I don't think so. Their names are Latimer and Randall. At least those are the names they used. Yes. But this might give us an even better lead. What's that? The woman was smart enough to make them give her a receipt for her cows. Oh, good for her. Latimer signed it. And no doubt left his fingerprints on it. Right. Well, first thing, we'll alert all local police and licensed slaughterhouses in the city and state. Give them the description of those two men. Yes, sir. And, Meade, while I'm getting that started, will you run that receipt through the lab for fingerprints? Right. I'd like to catch those fellas before they clean up and get out of the state. Okay. Good. There's a light on in Jenkins' office. Guess he's keeping a date, all right. But will he have the dough with him? Well, sure. Why not? He didn't guarantee it this afternoon. Yeah, this sounds like too good a touch to him. He'll have it. Now, come on. Now, wait a minute. What's the matter? Look in and see if anybody's with him. No, he's by himself. Okay. Knock on the door. Come in. Come in. Go ahead, Al. All right. Well, how are you tonight, Mr. Jenkins? Let's get down to business. Yeah, that suits me fine. You, uh, you got the dough ready? I have. Well, where is it? In my pocket. The deal starts when it's in my pocket, Mr. Jenkins. Oh, no. I'm not giving up any money until I see those cows. You ain't seeing no cows. What does he mean? Uh, we're kind of changing the deal. Hmm? Well, that 15000 goes to us direct. What for? Well, sort of like a bonus. What are you talking about? Ah, uh, quit wasting time with them, Chuck. Now, see here. What's this all about? You're paying us that 15 G's to keep quiet, Jenkins. What? You wouldn't like us to expose your operation here, would you? This is a licensed slaughterhouse, Latimer, and my books are clean. To a stranger, maybe, but not to the law. Look here. I've had enough of this. Oh, yeah? You're just trying to blackmail me. And what if we are? It won't work. No? No. Because I'm clean. You two are not. You couldn't report me to the law without getting slapped in jail yourselves, and you know it. Chuck, that angle ain't gonna work. It certainly is. Well, then I guess we'd better try another. The only thing that you can do is to get out of here and get out of here right now. Oh, that ain't the only thing. Get out, I say. Now, look, we came here for that 15 grand. We're going to get it. Go to work, Al. With pleasure. Now, wait a minute. You can't. Now, if you'll grab his wallet, Al, we'll turn out the lights and close up office for the night. May 31st, 1946, this is your FBI on Classic Radio Theater with Wyatt Cox. Classic Radio Theater with Wyatt Cox on your favorite station, May 31st, 1946, this is your FBI. (laughs) 
And now back to the FBI file, The Slaughterhouse Swindler. The professing good citizen who consorts or conspires with professional criminals to violate the law for personal gain is not only flirting with justice at the hands of the law, he is also courting personal disaster at the hands of those with whom he conspires. Because to criminals, the renegade citizen is not one of them. Rather, he is a pawn to be played by them when the time comes. And always, he is played for a sucker. It is nearly two hours now after the slaughterhouse operator, Jenkins, was beaten into unconsciousness by the cattle swindlers and robbed of $15,000. Agent in charge Clark of the Des Moines office of the FBI is at his desk talking with Special Agent Meade when... Clark speaking. Police headquarters, Mr. Clark. This is Sergeant Eaton. Oh, hello, Sergeant. We've got something that may tie in with those two men you're looking for. Oh? Well, just a minute. Mead. Yeah? Get on the other phone and catch us, too, will you? Right. All right, Sergeant. Go ahead. It's about a man named Jenkins who operates a slaughterhouse at the edge of town. Yes. The night watchman making his rounds found him beaten unconscious on the floor of his office a little over an hour ago. Mm -hmm. The watchman remembered hearing a truck drive into the yard earlier. I see. Just before he discovered Jenkins on the floor, he had heard the truck drive away. But he hadn't seen who was in it. No, with Jenkins on duty himself, he hadn't paid much attention. Where's the victim now, Sergeant? We got him to the city hospital. He just came to a little while ago. Well, what did he have to say? Well, that's just it. He wouldn't talk. Well, we'll get on it right away and check with you later, Sergeant. Goodbye. Thanks a lot. Bye. I guess we better get over to the hospital right away. No, later. What? First, we're going to have a look around out at the slaughterhouse. Why? We just might find some evidence with which we can encourage Mr. Jenkins to talk. Come on. I told the nurse not to let anybody else in my room. We're special agents of the FBI, Mr. Jenkins. Oh, that's so. And I have nothing to say to you either. This is my affair. We have reason to believe it's our affair, too. What do you mean? We've just come from your slaughterhouse. What are we doing there? Investigating the crime. Crime? What crime? Crime that's put you in this hospital. Now, look here. Well? I have nothing to say. All right, then, we have... We happened to run across a special memo of some cattle transactions which were not entered in your regular ledger, Mr. Jenkins. Hey, what of it? You're trying to tell me how to keep my books? Maybe the government will get around to that later. What do you mean? Right now, we're interested in finding two men named Latimer and Randall. Well? Some of those special cattle deals, according to the memo, were made with them. What of it? Latimer and Randall are wanted for cattle swindling by posing as agents of the Department of Agriculture. They were just cattle dealers to me. And you bought the cattle they obtained by criminal methods. As far as I was concerned, the cattle were their own. Mr. Jenkins, I'd like to point out that we're in a position to justifiably charge you with conspiracy for receiving and selling property obtained by criminal methods. But how can if you... If you're brought to court, you'd have to explain your books and special memos and all your slaughterhouse operations to some experts who might find something wrong with them. Well? What do you wish to know? Where are Latimer and Randall? I don't know. Who beat you up tonight? They did. Why? All I'm saying is they beat me up, stole $15,000 for me, and escaped in their truck. Can you describe their truck? It's a cattle truck, and the license number is written down in a notebook in my coat pocket. Made? Yes, Get the notebook, please, please. Right. But, Jenkins, the beating you've got tonight is what you might expect and deserve for playing ball with criminals. Please. When we catch Latimer and Randall, we'll get the whole story behind your dealings with them. And if it's what I think it is, you'll have quite a bit of explaining to do. Hey, wait. 
Wait, slow up, Al. Time to a fork in the highway. It's okay. We take the left turn to Kansas City. How do you know? I marked out the whole route on that map there. Okay, then keep going. Hey, Chuck. Yeah? Maybe we ought to get rid of this truck. Maybe it's getting hot by now. Yeah, I've been thinking of that already. Let's jump out of the truck for this break. May 31st, 1946. This is your FBI on Classic Radio Theater with Wyatt Cox. The conclusion follows these messages from your favorite station. Just going to take a minute here to tell you about the big savings going on now, the clearance sale at MyPillow.com. And you know, I've talked about how in my office, I have a pair of My Slippers, and they're really comfortable, and they're on clearance right now. The MyPillow.com slippers, $25 a pair, limit 10. And I would buy three or four more pairs. Unfortunately, they're out of my size. They also have sheets, pillowcases, clothing items, all on special right now. Go to MyPillow.com, click on the clearance tab at the top of the page, use my promo code Wyatt, or call 1-800-928-4715. Limited sizes remaining in the MyPillow slippers, limited colors on other items. MyPillow.com, clearance tab, promo code Wyatt, one 800 928-4715. Classic Radio Theater with Wyatt Cox. I think the crooks are starting to feel the heat. Let's get back to the truck. Uh, This is your FBI. May 31st, 1946, the Slaughterhouse Swindlers. So what do we do? The next town we hit, we kiss it goodbye and borrow somebody else's car. Here's the truck, Mr. Clark. We found it abandoned on a side street here earlier this morning. I see. And just a while ago, a man reported his car stolen during the night. Well, that sounds like two and two to me, officer. Well, that's what we figured. Maid. Yes? Well, I'm taking down the information on the stolen car. Will you have a look in the truck? Right. What's the description of the stolen car, officer? Black Chevrolet sedan, 41 model. Sedan, 41 model. Iowa license, 426. 426. 73. Mr. Clark. 73 with... Yes? Look at this map I found on the seat. What about it? Pencil mark tracing the whole route from Des Moines to Kansas City. Oh? You think maybe they might be... I think it? we're going to get out an alarm on this stolen car right away and then head for Kansas City. Okay, Al, uh, we didn't come to Kansas City for a rest. Now let's get busy. On what? I got a slaughterhouse all lined up to do business with us. We ain't got a truck. Well, we're going to use one of theirs. Okay, where do we go first? Well, we're following our same plan. I got number one spotted. Come on, let's ride. Clark. Oh, yes, mate. Latimer and Randall are in Kansas City. They're not in a hotel. No? I spent all morning with our agents and the police here checking. And no trace of them. No sign of a stolen car either? Not yet. Maybe this other thing will turn them up. What's that? Well, the county farm agent here in Kansas City has been helping me all morning make a lot of telephone calls. I don't get it. Well, Meade, I studied all those jobs that Latimer and Randall pulled around Des Moines. Yeah? And I think I've hit on the pattern of their operation. Really? And if I'm right... Well, if I'm right, maybe the phone is ringing right now with a proof. Mrs. Gilmer, we're sorry to have to report that we find five of your cows diseased. 
Good heavens, Mr. Latimer. That, that's going to be quite a blow to me. Well, the five head won't be a total loss to you, however. What do you mean? Well, as I told you when I made the appointment for this test, we're authorized to pay you a condemnation fee. Well, at least that's something. Come on, Randall. We'll start loading the cars in the truck. Okay. Those cars are staying right here, Latimer. Hey, who says? What's the idea and who are you? The special agents of the FBI. Do you want to hear any more? Put up your hands, Seaman. Well, sure, Randall. Sure, we'll put up our hands. Maybe you won't object if I use mine like this. Ooh. Here, mate. Take his gun. Right. Thanks for cooperating with us, Mrs. Gilmer. And thanks to you, Latimer, for your policy of cheating widows only. It made it a lot easier for us to catch you. Come on. <laughs> in the federal court on the charge of impersonating agents of the U.S. government. Latimer and Randall were found guilty and sentenced to the penitentiary. The findings at their trial also enabled FBI agents later to bring the slaughterhouse operator Jenkins to justice and bring about his conviction on a charge of conspiracy. Latimer and Randall, as professional criminals, were enemies of society. But Jenkins, a professing good citizen. Because he conspired with criminals and betrayed the welfare of those whom he would call fellow citizens, Jenkins was that something far morally worse than an enemy of society. He was a Benedict Arnold of society. And it is his kind which does more damage to the moral structure of society than all of its openly avowed enemies combined. Next week, we will bring you another colorful story from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation, The Sinister Lighthouse. The incidents used in tonight's Equitable Life Assurance Society's broadcast are adapted from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. However, all names used are fictitious, and any similarity thereof to the names of persons living or dead is accidental. Tonight, the music was composed and conducted by Frederick Steiner, the author was Frank Ferries, and your narrator was Dean Carlton. This is your FBI, is a Jerry Devine production. And now this is Carl Frank, speaking for the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States and the Equitable Society's representative in your community, and inviting you to tune in again next week at this same time when the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States will bring you another colorful story from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. The Sinister Lighthouse. On this is your FBI. This is ABC, the American Broadcasting Company. May 31st, 1946, this is your FBI on Classic Radio Theater with Wyatt Cox. Classic Radio Theater with Wyatt Cox. I remember when I got my first uh, collection of Lum and Abner, and uh, I was just very, very happy to have them. They were bad encodes. They were very noisy. They were very crackly. But they were fun to listen to. And thanks to Ted at RadioMemories.com, we have these uh, episodes of Lum and Abner that we're bringing you. Uh, this episode from May 31st, 1935, as they're still trying to figure out what they're going to do uh, as they go into the motion picture business. <laughs>
Howdy, everybody. Here we are all ready to take you down to Pine Ridge for another visit with Lum and Abner. And now, let's see what's happening down in Pine Ridge. Well, Lum and Abner's picture show is progressing nicely. They have a crew of men remodeling the old cotton warehouse into an up-to-date theater. And last night, they made a trip into the county seat and purchased a second-hand projector with which to show their films. As we look in on our old friends today, we find them down at the Jotham Down store making plans for the opening. Listen. Well, that gets everything but uh, piney now. Yeah. I-, I wish we could get along without that thing, Lum. That's going to run into money. Well, I ain't going to buy one, Abner. I'm going to rent that pi- player piney from Grandpappy Spears if I can. Yeah, but I- I'm just afraid you're going to run into trouble there, though. He's an awful close trader, Grandpappy. Yeah, but I've got a way studied up to handle him all right. Can I get through talking to him? You'll be wanting to let us use it for nothing. Yeah. Well, he's back there in the feed room now if you want to talk to him about it. Yeah, call him up here. Now, just let me do the talking. Grandpa's pretty hard to deal with, you know. Got to handle him just so. Yeah, yeah, if he knowed how bad we wanted it, why, he'd ask us three or four prices for it. Well, you got to use psychology on him. Uh, got to use what? Nothing. I'll use it. You just get him up here. Hey, Grandpa, come on up to the front of the store here. Me and Lom wants to see you about... Don't the... tell him what you want with him. Something. Just let me handle it now. Oh, I ain't gonna say nothing. Wait, you hollering at me, Abner? Yeah, come on up here a minute. Yeah, I want to have a little talk with you, Grandpap. Sit down. Yeah, Lama's going to use some psychology, don't you? Just hash up, Abner. What's the matter? Ain't my work been satisfaction? No. Your work has been fine, Grandpap. You're by fur the best clerk we've ever had in the store here. Oh, goodness sake. And I was just thinking, what a shame it is. Here you are, getting along in years and still working for wages. Yeah, you don't expect me to work for nothing, did you? No, but I mean you're just living from day to day, you might say. You ought to have a regular income, something you could depend on in case you're laid up to where you couldn't work. Yeah. Yeah, that'd be nice. Nice something to have, all right. If you just had something you could rent to somebody. So no matter where you worked or not, you'd still have money coming in all the time. Yeah, but I ain't got nothing nobody'd want to rent. Only thing I've got's my house and... If I rented that, I wouldn't have no place to live myself. Well, let's see. You ought to have something over where you could rent. Let's see. What have you got somebody might have some use for? Let me think. Yeah, don't you know, Lom, it's that player pine or he's got over? Abner, will you please hash? Yeah. I grannies, that's right. I hadn't thought about that. Glad you brung that up. Uh, what was that, Lom? Well, Abner here just now suggested you've got a player piney over there you might could rent. Yeah. Yeah, I've got one over there, but I don't know who in the world would want to rent it. Well, now, there ought to be somebody around here that'd have some use for that. Let me study. I'd love to help you if I can, Grandpa. I know somebody, Long. Will you stay out of this, Abner? Well, all right, but I could save you all that thinking if you just let me... Wait a minute. I believe I'm getting an idea. Huh? Yeah. Hi, right, Granny's Abner. We ought to have some music of some kind down there at the picture show of ours. Well, I'll be dead blame, Lum. You're the forgetfulest feller I ever seen in my life. Yeah, I'm glad I thought of that. Yeah, me and Abner might find some use for that piney down there to show, Grandpap. We've got to have some music of some kind down there. Yeah. Of course, we couldn't pay much for that, but uh, if it'd help you any out, why, we'd be glad to rent it off of you. Wouldn't we, Abner? Yeah, I reckon so. I don't know what to say now. You got me so mixed up. Mixed up? Why, yes, me and you sat here and talked about the same thing not ten minutes ago, Lum, and now you don't appear to recollect a thing about it. How much would you, I mean, uh, how little would you want to rent that for a grandpap? Oh, I don't know, Lum. I never had thought nothing about renting it. Now, think about it. Don't know what it's worth, hardly. Uh, Who was you aiming on getting to play it? Well, I was talking some to Evelina about getting her to play it first. Her school's about out, and if she could find something like that to do, she could stay here all summer instead of going back over to Belleville with her folks. Well, uh, Lom, I, I was a figuring on getting Pearl to play it. Well, I don't believe I'd want to let it out that way unless I'd done the playing of it myself. See, if a body's got to play one of them player pianers just sore, it don't sound right. Well, I thought all you had to do was just put a roll of music on there and 
pump them pedals up and down, they played itself. That's just what I allowed you to say, Abner. Average feller that don't know nothing about music would say the same thing. If you know the hours that I've put in practicing on that thing. Practicing? Why, sure. To play a player piano? Why, sure. They're as hard to play right as the other kind is. Well. There's buttons around on it. You've got to know just when to press them and all that. You've got to know when to play it soft and when to play it loud. You've got to put feeling in the music. Yeah. Granny's, I never had thought about that. No, me neither. Anybody's got to have strength to pedal clean through one of them rolls, too. Like Charity, now, she always gives out. She, she's a playing long to last. It gets so slow, the music sort of drags, sort of. She ain't got no talent for it, it looks like. No. Granny's, I believe Grandpa's just right about that, Abner. We want that music to sound right. Yeah, sure, yeah. Never know there was so much to it. Well, supposing we rented you and the piney both, Grand, uh, rented the piney and hired you to play it. How much would you have to have for that? Well, uh, that's how many nights a week? Uh, six nights a week. Monday to Saturday. And Sunday off. Well, that'd keep me up past my bedtime, wouldn't it? Hey, I'd be about 9.30 before you could get out of there. Yeah, but you'd get to see the show free. See, we wouldn't charge you nothing to see the picture. There's 25 cents a night you'd make right there. Hey, doggy, that ain't bad wages itself, you know what? Well, it amounts to a dollar and a half a week. Yeah. Well, I'll tell you what I'll do, man. I'll furnish the piano and do the plan for four dollars a week. Four dollars? Well, three dollars then. Yeah. Wait just a minute. Let me and Abner have a little meeting about that. Come here, Abner. He's a little high, any he, Yeah, but recollect, it's the only player pine in town that I know of. And that's a heap cheaper than buying one. Yeah, I reckon so. Well, I guess we'll take you up on it, Grandpap. Uh, just thinking, too, Lum. I'm going to have to bring Charity along with me every night. Couldn't leave her there at home by herself. You mean that you want us to pass her in free, too? Well, that's the only way I can get out every night. Well, <clears throat> all right, we'll pass your woman in free, too. Now then, what's worrying me is how we're going to get down there every night. How you gonna get down there? Why, well, just walk down there like everybody else is going to. Well, I don't know, Abner. After dark that away, me or Charity, neither one can't half see to get around. I was just thinking, might you get that nephew of mine to drive us over in his car? Why, yeah, sure. Why, well, that's just a thing to do. Just get Luke to drive you over every night. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, that straightens that situation out. Well, uh, Piney, do you's all settled in? Yeah. <laughs> well, of course, we couldn't expect Luke to. Sit out there in the car and wait for me every night till the show's over. You mean that you want to pass for Luke, too? Well, it just looks like there ain't no way out of it, Abner. Oh, me. All right, then Luke gets in for nothing, then. Yeah, if he can do it. If he can do it? What do you mean, if he can do it? Well, I don't know where Luke's going to be able to get out of a night without bringing his family along or not. See, that woman of his won't hardly let him out of his sight. Well, now, Grandpa. If you're hinting for a pass for Luke and his woman and all nine of them young'uns, well, there ain't a thing of doing. I'll tell you that right now. Well, just suit yourself about that, Abner. Well, that's just carrying things too far. I was just trying to help you fellas out. It don't matter none to me. I can play it over at the house. Well, just play it over at the house, then. We ain't gonna let the whole town of Pine Ridge in free just to get you down there by night. Well, now, wait a minute. Excuse us a minute, Grandpa. Come here, Abner. He's just trying to get all his relates in for nothing. That's all he's doing, Mom. That's what he's doing. Yeah, looks like he's got us, don't he? Well, sure, he knows that we want it, the old skin flint. I uh, hate him to pieces. Well, we, blame him. No, now, wait a minute. We better close a deal with him before he thinks about that second cousin of his that lives over there on Brush Creek and his family. Yeah, yeah, that's right. I'd forgot about them. Well, it just looks like it. we're going to have to... Bazaar the first two rows down there every night for the piner player. Well, that's a heap cheaper than buying one. Yeah. Uh, well, all right, just do what you like about it. I don't care. Yeah. Wish we could get him down a little bit, though. Boy. Well, I know it. He just got his head set. He knows that we want it. He knows that's the only one in town. That's the way that old man deals with him. I'll be quite easy listening. Yeah, I wish he'd hear me. I just, I can't stand him at all. Well, Grandpap, uh, me and Abner's talked it over, and we'll take it. Or, I mean, you're hard. 
I still think, though, you're a little high on your prices. Yeah, I know Dad blame well is. I don't think nothing about it. Well, I mean, like you said a while ago, I never had thought about it just that way, but man get up my age working for wages, just living from day to day, you might say. Why, he ought to have a regular income, something he can depend on in case he's laid up to where he couldn't work. Yeah, yeah, there's that dad blame psychology you was talking about, Lum. Well, <laughs> if Lum makes many more deals like this, they won't have seats for the cash customers. <laughs> Just a minute, folks, before we close. I brought along tonight a letter I think you should all hear. It's from Mr. J.B. Googe of Kingsport, Tennessee. He writes, I thought that you'd all like to know just what I think about your Horlicks malted milk tablets. I'm a fireman, and I'm exposed to an excessive amount of heat. I don't need to tell you that when a man is exposed to heat, he's apt to become tired and fatigued. That's what I like about Horlicks tablets. One tablet every so often braces you up and makes you feel keen and refreshed. I always carry a flask along wherever I go. Well, thank you, Mr. Googe. Your letter, I think, speaks for itself. It's typical of many that we receive about Horlick's tablets from folks in all parts of the country for all kinds of needs. You can get Horlick's tablets, you know, in two flavors, both natural and chocolate, from your druggist. This is Carlton Brickard, speaking for Lum and Abner and Horlick's, who now bid you all good night and good health. Way they're going, they are going to give it away. Lum and Abner, May 31st, 1935. Show courtesy of Ted at RadioMemories.com. All righty, we thank you for tuning in today. Visit our webpage, ClassicRadio.stream. You can stream our shows on demand, lists of sites where our shows are available via podcast. Social media links are available there. You can learn how to build a classic radio collection of your own. And you can buy me a copy to help us acquire additional classic radio collections and maintain our distribution channels. That's at ClassicRadio.Stream. ClassicRadio.Stream. Thank you so much for tuning in. Tell all your friends the greatest radio shows of all time are right here at this spot on the dial. Classic Radio Theater with Wyatt Cox on your favorite radio station.